Okay, we'll get started. Um, let me stand in front of the camera as well to wave hello to everyone online. Um, welcome everyone. So I'm really delighted to have uh, Julie uh, Williamson here today from University of Glasgow. Uh, known Julie for a number of years. Um, I remember seeing a talk at Kai, I think it was one in Glasgow where you talked about putting a, a headset on an airplane. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So today's talk is continue on this about using uh, well, about extended reality. Uh, and Julie's been a very active member in the Kai, the ACM SIGKAI community as well, uh, being in charge of the well, ACM publications chair. So seeing through our big changes there, we've tr transitioned through everything. Um, uh, took papers chair on for the Kai that just took place last week and will be um, technical program chair for next Kai in Hawaii. So uh, looking forward to that and thank you for your service. I'm very much looking forward to visiting this place uh, of Hawaii. It sounds like it's meant to be very delightful. But over <laughs> to you now, Julie, for your talk. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for having me here today. Thank you for the introduction. As uh, Duncan said, yeah, so I'm Julie Rico Williamson. I am an academic at the University of Glasgow. Uh, it's the Glasgow Interactive Systems Group, which makes an acronym GIST. Uh, don't ask me how the letters line up. Um, and yeah, we're a group of academics working in human-computer interaction. And for my part, uh, I work in the kind of immersive technologies part of the group. Um, and my background is in computing science, uh, but also taking drawing a lot from other disciplines and now working in quite an interdisciplinary uh, space in human-computer interaction. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot when we talk about immersive technologies are these terms AR, XR, VR, everything. Um, and for the scope of this talk, uh, I'll use the term XR kind of throughout. Uh, and when I use that term, what I mean is um, thinking about immersive technologies as a continuum from reality to virtuality and everything in between. I firmly believe that we'll be living in a kind of possible future where this is a continuous space. And all of these terms will kind of become meaningless because it will just be a continuum between reality and virtuality. So I use the term XR to try to capture that, um, even though I recognize the hardware that we have doesn't really do that yet. But that's the kind of possible future I think that we're, we're moving towards. So I'll use the term XR to talk about everything continuous between reality and virtuality. And one of the things that... Yeah? You said XR, you said a lot, right? And I'm still sure that I feel like you might as well. So when you say XR, can you tell me, I guess if you want to say, when I'm XR, this is XR, we have virtual reality or extreme virtual reality, but can you help me imagine what that looks like? Like, I think you're, I know there's something you're getting a bit, but I'm not quite getting my head. Yeah. So let me think, oh yeah, I can just follow that all. I see this good digital. Here's what I should be thinking about this one. Yeah, well, certainly as we do our work now, it's quite segmented. Uh, so we have virtual reality. We know definitely what virtual reality is, full virtuality. We have, yeah, something that fully occludes reality. Uh, even the headsets we have don't fully occlude reality, but that's the kind of theoretical ideal. Full occlusion of reality on one side and full inclusion of reality on the other side. Um, and within that, right now, it's not a continuum, but it could be. It could be. Yeah, so we might include uh, you know, things like AR, which are closer to the reality side, VR, which is closer to the uh, theoretical virtuality side. But I, I do firmly believe that we'll be in a space where this is continuous in the future. Um, so a lot of these terms won't, uh, won't mean anything anymore because it will just be a continuous space that we move dynamically uh, from reality to virtuality as the situation uh, and our desire kind of leads us. So, so that's the kind of possible future I'm thinking of. Yep. Sorry, just because I think it's important. So is it fair to say that um, when you say XR, what you're kind of saying is everyone, can you show us the of the that right now we're in for reality and what is the case of things that we see now and what makes the virtual? So like we should also kind of think about that. That's the position you're trying to gain for us. Yeah, yeah. Thinking of it as a continuous space, reality to virtuality. Um, and the reason, you know, why I think this is an interesting space uh, to be thinking about, I, I do think that's where we're moving in the future. Uh, and so I put this as a kind of provocation, uh, as an image of where I think we might be moving. Um, I really wonder what it will mean to connect as kind of human beings, as people in a future where we're engaging with immersive technologies in our everyday lives. What will that look like and what will that mean? 
that's the kind of big, broad question, and I don't have the answer to that. Um, and what I want to think about is if we think that this is a possible future where our human kind of interactions will be mediated uh, by technology, what does interpersonal interaction look like in this possible future? Now, the threads of this future exist now, right? We constantly dip into something like uh, virtuality. Maybe I look at it through a window on my phone or I disengage from reality by attending to something else. The threads are already there. And I know that we probably, all of us, maintain our relationships uh, through virtual or digital means now. Um, but we might be moving towards something where that's much more integrated into our everyday life. Greeting someone on the street and giving them a hug may become something that's an immersive experience and something that looks very different to what we experience now. So that's the high level kind of end point, uh, the, the kind of provocation. Um, and for me, the challenge that I see when we look at immersive technology and a lot of the, the hardware that we know now is that if we don't make interpersonal interaction feel good in XR, then these technologies will fragment us and really divide our experiences. A lot of the things that we see now with immersive technology focus on highest level of immersion, highest level of excitement, um, and that can actually be quite a fragmenting experience. I know probably all of us can think of some of the dystopian futures that immersive technology kind of presents, the things that fragment us, the things in pop culture that uh, you know make us maybe afraid of immersive technology. I think those are very real possibilities, right? If we don't solve this problem of making interpersonal interaction feel good in XR, well, then we're gonna have these isolating interactions instead. So that's kind of the driving factor for what I wanna do in my own research. Um, but the kind of challenge that I have is how do we marry this high level aspirational goal with the routine science of our everyday practice? The things that we're talking about when we publish papers at CHI or any other venue, or as I say, what our routine science is, is probably a little bit distant from the high level motivations of why we do the things we do. Um, so the talk today, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the routine science that I do and where that uh, is kind of going and the trajectory towards what I hope is the kind of high level uh, aspiration and something that maybe is changing some of the definitions of XR. Um, but the routine science is kind of a little bit of a, a distance between those two. So I'll talk about my research trajectory towards social XR. Um, and I've done this work and kind of, I'll talk about three themes today. First, looking at proxemics in physical and virtual environments. This is my very quantitative work. Um, it's very uh, quantitative in nature. This is social signal processing in physical environments, virtual environments. I love this work. I find it really inspiring, but I also talk about it in terms of being more routine science. This is some of the fundamental things that are a little bit easier to make concrete. Social signal processing, and I'll talk about some of the motivations behind that. Moving kind of past some of the routine science, one of the things we've also been looking at are asymmetric interactions in XR. These are things that exist mostly now. These are constraints we see with the hardware that we already work with. Um, and we've done a lot of different methods here where we kind of branch out a little bit more past the quantitative work. Um, so we're doing some things around enactment, some things around uh, surveys, um, but we're looking at kind of very near future uh, technologies there or things that we already have right now. And taking one step further, to the more distant future from that, we've also been looking at really speculative methods uh, for social XR. So we've been making prototypes of things that don't exist uh, or technologies that uh, are not really possible to, to work just now, but we still think it's important to look towards that more distant future and see what methods make sense for actually guiding us towards the desirable future and away from undesirable futures. So I'll start with the quantitative work because I feel like it's the most concrete and kind of the most the most straightforward. This is really my my routine science that I that I like, um, and all of this is based on the idea that observable behaviors give us insights into how interpersonal interaction is unfolding. And when I talk about observable behaviors, I'm drawing a lot from Goffman and ethnomethodology around 
the things that we perform, the actions that we give and give off are all the kind of material of how our interaction is unfolding. So that's how we orientate our bodies towards each other, how we perform attention, how we maintain eye contact. Um, all of these social signals are the kind of uh, meat of this interaction. And for me, the interesting thing comes from the interpersonal social signal. So that's not you know, gesture recognition or facial recognition. It's determining, is there a shared point of reference that we're both pointing to? Are our facial recognitions, uh, are our facial uh, expressions aligning or desynchronizing? Uh, anytime there's two or more people interacting, there's a signal that exists between those people. Uh, and those are the connections that I find really interesting and where the social signal processing has really um, intrigued me in terms of how behavior unfolds and what can we observe. So I started this work uh, in physical settings. Uh, Pre-pandemic, a lot of my work was at festivals or kind of cultural events and started with public displays. And I wanted to see what can we, from observing people's behavior, learn about how the technology is changing that space. So in this case, uh, I did a lot of work with spherical displays and, uh, and in this particular walkway as well. Um, and so in this case, it's just a playful, uh, simple interface. If you enter this ring of boxes and touch the display, you control the lights in the boxes. Really simple, really playful. But what we were interested in is how the presence of this display changes how people move through the space. Um, and so we used some cameras mounted above the walkway to see where do people walk, where do they spectate, uh, where do they avoid uh, this uh, interaction. And so this gave us a lot of nice insights into kind of group flows of how pedestrians walk. Uh, and I have a lot of data of this particular walkway um, because we didn't just uh, deploy this display. Um, and you can see over time real trends. Uh, there's particular bollards that people cut through. Um, there's particular areas uh, where people tend to, to cross over. Um, and it, pedestrian traffic is very sensitive to changes uh, in, the, in the environment. So things like the presence of this display create a completely different pattern than when it's not there. One time I saw a real difference in the data because uh, I watched this data for weeks and weeks. And um, the difference in the data, when I went back to look at the images, someone had tied a bike to one of the bollards and it creates this big uh, kind of you know, block in the pedestrian traffic. We also did some kind of uh, interventions of our own. So we had a musician stand on the walkway and play uh, and for anybody who loves street music, you'll be very sad to hear that this didn't impact pedestrian traffic and people ignored this poor fellow. Um, and it was just an interesting thing to see how are people attending to, to things in the environment. So in this walkway, um, we really focused on this kind of pedestrian traffic and um, how people move through space when we change things about the space. <clears throat> but of course, Lockdown meant that people weren't walking around in public spaces and groups anymore. Um, and I turned my attention to virtual environments. One of the nice things about virtual environments is that we can fully instrument these and do really high fidelity logging uh, and understanding what's going on in that space. So we have the head position, the body position, and that is then kind of a pairwise comparison of those values to every other person in the space. Uh, and that's running at you know 60 frames a second. So now we had a lot more meat to work with in terms of social signal processing in this space. Um, the first event that we uh, kind of analyzed was actually a workshop at Kai. Um, and in this case, we had a few different types of spaces um, and we saw some of the same things that we would expect in physical environments. When, for example, we put the display in the walkway, we saw that disrupts the pedestrian traffic. In this case, we saw that people hovered around the outside of this floor decal. This is a virtual floor decal. It has no impact on where people should be standing in a virtual environment, but people didn't want to stand on it. Um, we saw really different behaviors when people were in the small breakout rooms versus the big room, uh, and certainly their behaviors when they're milling around in a kind of unfocused interaction are different than the ones we see when they're at a focused interaction like a paper presentation. So this is the work that we presented at CHI uh, 21. Um, and that was our first kind of foray into social signal processing in a virtual environment. 
And again, really focusing on that interpersonal social signal. What signals exist when two or more people are in a space together? We wanted to do some more controlled comparisons as well to understand whether being embodied in VR versus um, on a desktop uh, PC changed the way people used space and the way they interacted with each other. So I'll explain this uh, visualization. So what this is, is this is the viewpoint of every person in a small group overlaid on each other. Um, and the field of view is the kind of uh, 46 degrees uh, that you see there. Um, people who are standing around them are the gray dots. And when they're speaking, they're red. On the left, we see this is people who are wearing an HMD. When people are wearing a head mounted display and engaging in uh, this virtual environment, they turn to face the active speaker. They make eye contact and they keep the active speaker mostly in their field of view. When people are on the desktop PC, you see very little movement. People stand in relatively static positions and they don't kind of perform their attention in the same way. The affordance is there. Uh, you just have to move your mouse, your viewpoint. You have the spatialized audio, but people don't do it. Um, and our kind of ongoing work now is looking at, does that performance of attention actually make conversation more fluent, more fluid? Does it make it easier for people to turn take? Uh, and that's the kind of ongoing work because we know that in VR, people do perform this attention. So that's the kind of ongoing work, um, but we found that you know, in the embodied virtual environment, interaction does really unfold quite differently uh, compared to on a desktop uh, PC. One of the things we do then is once we had an idea, we know that, you know, this PC versus uh, desktop experience or the VR versus desktop experience is quite different. We wanted to look at how is that working when people are actually co-located in a space together? That's kind of the first step uh, to XR being part of our lives. Some people are gonna adopt it and some people aren't. Um, and so this creates a really interesting boundary uh, that one of my PhD students has really focused on. Uh, the idea of looking at the boundaries between XR users and others kind of exposes the current barriers to that interpersonal interaction. When is technology getting in the way? Um, and so one of my students has done a lot of work in this space looking at how people interact when some people have XR and some people do not. <clears throat> and so we have devices that do this. And so this is our kind of, we we'll call our, our near future uh, interactions. Um, one of the first studies that we did was enactment of interruptions. Um, I don't know how many people here have tried to interrupt a VR user or in, engage with them while they're using VR. Uh, it's a pretty strange experience uh, and it's kind of can be even fun to kind of you know, mess with people who are in VR. Um, but we wanted to kind of enact these interruptions. So we had a couple different applications we had people use, some that were quite passive, uh, you know, watching documentaries and some that are quite active like Beat Saber, where it can actually be dangerous to walk close to someone who's using the application. Um, and so we had one VR user interacting with an application and another person prompted, go and interrupt them, get their attention. Um, and we found, as you might expect, the kind of primary modalities are speech and touch. Um, speech being kind of preferred and touch being something that uh, can be very disruptive to that person who's in VR. If you've ever been in VR and someone comes up and touches you, you know how jarring it is, right? Uh, you really need to have a, a, a relationship with that person and be expecting them to be nearby. Um, so the relationship is really important uh, to how people interrupted each other. And it kind of pointed out in the way people enacted uh, these interruptions, that some of them are quite playful, uh, let's say kind of playing a joke on one of your friends, uh, but there is also a real power imbalance. Uh, a kind of VR user in this situation could be quite vulnerable. Uh, they don't see the person who's there uh, and they, they can be vulnerable to these kind of uh, interruptions. <clears throat> so we tried another method to gather more of these experiences of asymmetric interactions. One person is in VR, one person isn't. Um, and we used a, a method where we gathered user stories of their experiences 
So this was a kind of survey method that had quite large open-ended questions to gather the stories. And then we classified the stories and analyzed uh, some different attributes of them. Um, and so some of the kind of, we had the qualitative stories and then paired with a bunch of kind of benchmark questions to help with the classification. So things like how often have you experienced the thing you're describing? Uh, how often do you feel the need to interact uh, with a VR user who's in your life? Um, you know, how comfortable are you interacting with this person? Um, just to get some kind of benchmark data for all the stories. And the most common issues were all around um, how to interrupt um, when things are occluded. Uh, so that might be the things the VR user is seeing are occluded from you, or things that are in the environment are occluded from the VR user. Uh, and of course, collisions. Um, one of the kind of, you know, I think most uh, kind of silly one, you know, collisions where, you know, a pet is running around the house and kind of causing all sorts of chaos to a VR uh, experience was one that was there. <laughs> and again, what really came out was this uh, power dynamic between VR users and bystanders in kind of both, uh, both senses. Uh, one kind of example that we found was people, you know, filming or recording a VR user kind of without their consent. When you've seen people in VR playing Beat Saber, they look ridiculous, right? They look absolutely ridiculous. So they're, they're quite vulnerable to people recording them and, and capturing them in a way that they can't really see. Um, again, people being touched, uh, a VR user being touched by people, again, it's very jarring and can be very uncomfortable depending on the relationship uh, between different people. And finally, we've had some interesting stories around using bystanders as proxy objects. Um, passive haptics, of course, is an area of research um, that we all know uh, and have seen different kind of things. But using humans as a proxy, proxy object is another strange and dark uh, part of VR and immersive tech that uh, came through the stories. This is already happening now. Um, and I think it's important to kind of design for these things because it's, a, it's an interesting and odd place for, for VR technology to be living. So our final bit of work on this asymmetric interactions is actually what uh, my student uh, Joseph kind of presented at CHI this year, um, was we wanted to look in a little bit more depth and actually have some design interventions and looking at when do those uh, VR user needs change over time. Um, so the picture is a little bit dark, but there was a few different types of um, information that we thought we can provide to the VR user to make that power imbalance a little bit more even. Um, so things like a text notification, which is flagged here as TN, um, having photo real avatars um, come into the virtual experience, um, which is put as PA. Um, we also had a few different variations on pass-through views. You can see the detailed implementations of those in the paper, um, and also doing things like dynamically lowering or removing audio when someone enters your kind of physical space. Um, and so we presented these kind of narratives to each uh, kind of survey respondent. This was delivered as a survey uh, and asked what type of mechanisms the VR user would want to see uh, given what the bystander was doing. So this is another example. These um, survey images, this doesn't really work with the current headsets that we have, uh, but we mock up these kind of um, visuals uh, to hope, hopefully inform the design of those systems as the hardware becomes more advanced. But we found a lot of interesting things around um, how the VR user, um, their behavior changes uh, based on where the position and the actions of the bystander. So we actually need quite a lot of information about that setting um, to kind of appropriately respond when people are moving around a VR user uh, and when depending on what they're doing. So the interpersonal social signal kind of comes back again uh, and could be then the trigger for some of these design interventions. The last kind of thread is then our kind of more distant uh, future. Um, and looking at the kind of future of XR uh, as we look further into the future requires more speculation and more speculative methods. So this is work uh, from my master's student, uh, uh, Ross, who's pictured here. 
Um, and what we did is we created design fictions, which is the top row or kind of images from the design fiction, but we implemented small pieces of these fictions so they were interactive and that they were stable enough that we could put people in public spaces to experience them. Um, so a kind of deployable design fiction. Um, and he came up with kind of three concepts, again, following this thread of kind of immediate future, near future, distant future. Um, so the first um, image uh, on the top uh, left um, is an idea of kind of walking down the street and being uh, kind of bombarded by immersive media. Um, and so there was the kind of narrative in the uh, design fiction around, um, you know, walking through the street. Uh, you can see the, the alt kai paper for the kind of full detail of the narrative. Uh, but this was implemented on Nreal glasses um, and Wizard of Oz uh, to some extent to be triggered at interesting moments. But we had people walk around the campus and be bombarded with these images uh, and these experiences in a real physical setting. Looking to the kind of middle distant future, um, we chose the kind of context of an immersive workspace. Um, and there was um, a kind of lecture to be seen and then phone calls to come in and some different things to interact with. Um, and this was experienced again in a kind of semi-public space on the campus, imagining that you're a student studying and this is what your immersive study environment looks like. Again, this was mostly a deterministic kind of uh, narrative design fiction with a few working elements to kind of create the experience. And then the final uh, design fiction um, is the idea of the experience machine. Uh, it's a concept uh, from uh, some philosophy that we quite like. Uh, and the idea of the experience machine is if um, virtual reality is indistinguishable from reality, would you choose to live your life in a virtual environment? Um, and uh, the original thought experiment was, uh, it was hoped that people would reject this idea of a false reality, um, but actually people, a lot of people want to do this. Um, and so we kind of created a bit of a narrative around the experience machine and, and selecting your life. And this was experienced in the, uh, in our lab setting, which kind of this uh, green screen kind of anonymous place. Um, so all of these design fictions worked and functioned and could be deployed and people experienced them in real settings. We have a lot of qualitative data from that, but because there are working elements, there's also a lot of quantitative data um, that I found quite, quite nice. So we looked at mostly at the types of gestures that people performed and how they behaved in these different settings. Um, and things like um, we have the kind of energy of, of gestures, how close they were into the body and how kind of expansive they were away from the body. Um, so that's kind of uh, distance, uh, the Euclidean distance from your body and the energy that's in the gesture. Um, we also looked uh, at kind of the placement of gestures um, relative to your body. So we see on the bottom left, um, this is kind of your field of view and where the hands were when people were gesturing in front of them. Um, and you see things like in the private indoor setting and in quest, uh, that was uh, the indoor uh, kind of the final design fiction. The gestures are much kind of further out and in the outdoor kind of public setting, they're, they're much further in. Um, and so we see people's behavior actually really being changed by, by the content of the design fictions. Uh, and I also really liked some of the analysis we did about the face of the palm, whether gestures are facing away from you or towards into your body. Um, and again, we see a real difference in the type of, in the location and the way that people kind of use their bodies. So this particular, uh, exercise was individuals kind of experiencing these design fictions in public settings. Um, but we also have been looking at groups of people uh, and how they experience things. Um, and one of the things my other PhD student, Laura has been working on are looking at um, which elements of reality are needed to anchor your virtual experiences when you're in public and social settings. And this is another place where the types of settings that we want to work in and the kind of capability of the hardware, it isn't there for us to experience these uh, what we call reality anchors in real settings. So we simulate these types of places and we use enactment. Um, so this is an example of one of her prototypes um, where you might be on a um, subway. Um, and if you could choose which parts of reality you want to include and what they look like, how would you do that? 
Um, and we do these uh, enactments where everybody who's in there has some access to the uh, virtual world, varying levels of access. So we have uh, some participants who are viewing it through a window on their mobile phone. We have some participants in a kind of HMD that is similar in capabilities to what we have now. And then we have another participant who has our reality anchors, uh, this prototype enabled, and they can choose which elements, uh, which people they want to see and when they want to see them. Um, and so we do an enactment of these multi-person uh, interactions in a, we have a, we have a partially built out uh, um, airplane uh, carriage <laughs> in our lab. So we do these enactments in a kind of, you know, real seats that are kind of seated as you would uh, in, a, in a real place. Um, but it requires quite a controlled environment for the uh, enactment to kind of work. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, how are people going to respond if the technology could do this? So it still leaves the open question, you know, how do we speculate farther and farther into the future? Um, the routine science has obviously got to be on the critical path towards these, these distant futures, but the, the link. But uh, it's something where um, I'm trying to kind of think about that in terms of like immediate future, near future and distant future, and which methods are appropriate for which uh, question. So in general, the kind of open challenges and what I'm focusing on over the next uh, couple of years, I hope. Um, one of the current gaps, which I really see uh, is that we, we don't have models that, uh, of XR that kind of capture human experience across the XR continuum. Um, the work that we did in the physical environments makes a lot of sense. The work that we did in the purely virtual environments makes a lot of sense. What happens when those uh, people and those signals are moving across these environments in increasingly complex ways? Some of the signals don't exist or make sense in other environments. Some of them are not captured. Um, some of them collide as we move across these environments. Um, so definitely we need new models that actually capture what does an interpersonal social signal look like and across, uh, not only between people, but across uh, realities. This, this is the open question for me right now. I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about. The hypothesis that I have is that if we can model social signals between people and between realities, we can actually um, see in the social signal when interaction is destabilizing. So when does interaction become hard? When do we find there's conflict there? Things like when do our social signals desynchronize? When are they in conflict? Um, how do we design for stabilizing interaction? We all feel this pretty innately. Like imagine the last Zoom call you were in where you can tell interaction is falling apart. We feel it, um, but we don't have any models that kind of capture when that's happening. And I believe that we can do that. I, I believe that in our observable social signals, we can capture when interaction destabilizes. And if we can capture the destabilization, we can design to restabilize. And if we can do that, I think that's the end point where we can improve the quality of interpersonal interaction in XR. If we can make interaction feel good in XR, then I think we'll preserve kind of what, how we connect as human beings and XR can be a positive part of our possible future instead of one that's isolating and fragmenting. So without further ado, thank you very much for having me and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, so unfortunately, your mic has failed. So you can. So we've got one that needs to be passed around. So we can pass around the, the magic shell. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your wonderful and very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, have you looked into the perception of users of the digital spaces? Because, so for example, um, what I saw with people of social anxiety that mental states like affecting how they perceive spaces and I think there's a lot overlap here um, and I was just curious your take on this kind of overlap between these two worlds. Yeah I mean it's definitely one of the things you know how people enter and perceive spaces is, is very complex um, and I know this is maybe a 
bit of a cop-out answer, uh, but certainly methodologically and, and theory-wise, um, I've been focusing on like the observable external part of people's behavior. So I think that would be visible in the social signal, um, but in terms of like internal state uh, and mental models, it's kind of, it's from a slightly different history, uh, you know, academically. Um, and so I think we'd see that in the social signal, but I, I try to set a clear boundary of, but I don't know what's going on in someone's internal state. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a question, I think it goes both, both ways as well. Of whatever data we collect, are we sure that it's a proxy for the thing that we think it is? Uh, and so it's an open question. Would that behavioral data be a good representation of internal state? And would internal state be a good representation of the data we observe? I think there's a lot of open questions there. Great talk, Julie, thank you. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting when you're talking about gestures in different social or non-social contexts um, and how sort of expansive some people were and, and others weren't. So do you think there's like a cultural dimension and also a context specific dimension to this? Um, and how would we start investigating all these nuances? Because I guess there's a personality dimension to it as well, because I'm always expansive and other people are not, you know, invading his personal spaces. Yeah, I mean, this is one <laughs> where, where we know there's a huge variation in people across cultures, personality, uh, style, context. I mean, I'll behave differently when I'm, you know, at home with my family than when I'm out with, with everybody else. Um, and so I think it's one of those things that's nice to allow to kind of vary naturally in the population rather than trying to do kind of controls like, okay, this is this group of people, this is this group of people. Because I think some of the metrics that we're looking at when it's interpersonal social signal stand even in the face of this variation. So naturally, you know, let's say we're out uh, somewhere together and you're gesturing really expansively. Uh, we know that like with social synchronization, people around you will naturally start to do the same thing. So I think if we take like kind of one uh, like order up from the gesture recognition to the, are we aligning? Uh, are we clashing? Um, are we kind of desynchronizing? These signals will still hold even when there's a huge amount of variation between the individuals who are there. That's the hypothesis, um, which I hope will will make sense. But yeah, we, the, the specific, uh, signals that we're looking at yeah, are synchronization, uh, alignment, and collision. Um, and I think those things will hold, even given natural variation in, in personal style. I'm going to jump in and ask one from online. This is coming from uh, Siddhant, and he asks, uh, well, he says, hi, Julie, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering, with the experiment in which you ask users if you'd prefer to stay in an AR environment if it becomes realistic, uh, did you perhaps also ask their reasons to prefer AR than the real world? Thanks again. So I have to think back to the specifically um, where this uh, goes, but um, we, I think this goes to some of the things that were in the, the slide. One of the things that we kind of imagined were that we know that once you're in an immersive environment, there's a bit of an opportunity cost to exit. Uh, it's very jarring to pull a headset off suddenly. Um, and so with the idea of this kind of increasing amount of information going into the environment for the VR user, it's the idea that you could keep one foot in the virtual environment and bring in more and more of reality as you need. Um, and so we didn't specifically ask, you know, why would you stay uh, in AR or VR? But the kind of design was certainly geared towards, you know, at what point do you feel the need to fully exit uh, and kind of delaying that until until it was needed. Um, but again, this kind of because that was our kind of near future uh, prototype, we're still looking at some of these boundaries as being quite discrete. It's not a continuous space yet. I can't you know, do a slider and, and bring in reality yet, which is what I would like. That's I, I don't know what that looks like exactly, but I want reality to work like that. Um, and so, yeah, in this case, we had these kind of really discrete boundaries of at what point, you know, how much reality do you need before you just say, no, okay, I need to go into reality. We don't have a continuous space there yet.
Uh, thank you for your really awesome talk, Julie. Uh, I just had a question about, so you did earlier work on public displays and with augmented reality becoming more of a thing and potentially in the future, what future do you see for public displays? Do you think they will still exist or is there gonna be some sort of symbiotic relationship with displays in the future? Yeah. Just really curious. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a really natural jump from public displays to AR, I think for this reason, right? Um, AR is a, just a public display that's experienced privately. Um, and so it was a really natural jump for me to go from being in public displays to thinking about other ways we might augment reality. Um, I think there's an interesting fundamental difference because you know it's that idea of a public display that's uh, private. Um, and so there's a big difference between things that kind of exist within the world that we live in and things that act on our perceptions and change the way we experience the world we live in. I think it's a pretty fundamental shift that uh, perceptually means something very different. Uh, so our mobile phone, you know, exists in the world and we can experience it. And that's very different from me kind of interjecting something into my perception and making me think there's a mobile phone there. So it's an interesting difference and it's a bit of a leap in terms of uh, how we experience the world around us. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, that this morning, you know, when we sit here together, uh, for the most part, we assume we're uh, experiencing roughly the same thing. We'll be attending to different things, we'll be interpreting it differently, but we know at least the stimuli we're all experiencing is sort of the same. Uh, that's not true in a world where immersive tech is around. We'll be experiencing materially different realities even though we're sitting here together. So it fundamentally changes the social contract of what it means to experience something together. Um, so yeah, public displays are certainly were the starting point, things existing within the world. AR displays, immersive displays, now we're changing the way I experience the world. So it's 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 a natural progression, one that I think uh, is where all the exciting action is just now. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to ask about um, augmented reality and kind of what features of reality, what interactions you found people wanted to wanted to keep in their augmented reality experience. So, what were those anchor points? Yeah, so when we're talking about our reality anchor uh, paper, we we started with a huge range of things, what people might want to keep. Do they want to keep people? Do they want to keep, you know, the floor, the furniture, uh, objects that are moving around? Um, and we thought, you know, all these things help you in the real world, you know, orientate your experience and know where things are. Um, as it turns out, only the moving things are quite, are, are, are kind of, universally wanted uh, by people. Um, so the other people that are around us, uh, people wanna see the other people and especially when they start coming towards you. Um, but also the kind of moving objects um, are something that are quite uh, generally kind of wanted uh, to be brought into the virtual experience. One of the reasons why we look at transport contexts um, when you're in VR is because not only are the things around you moving, but you are moving through space. So that was one of the other anchors um, that people wanted, not where's the furniture, where's the seats, but where am I right now? Like I'm moving through physical space and my virtual environment is, is not necessarily moving. Um, and so we like the, the transport context because it adds this extra layer of, of, of uh, I don't know, unknown into, into what's going on in the real world. Um, but yeah, it's, it's these kind of dynamic pieces of the reality, which people really want to maintain some kind of awareness of and to bring into the virtual. 